for those who might worship you in spirit and in truth. And that doesn't mean those who come together and sing nice songs on Sunday, but those who might take their lives and make them a living sacrifice to you, King. You've come and you've dwelt amongst us this morning. God, we've declared your amazing grace that took us from lost to found, from blindness to sight, from being bound to being free, from being captured to being ransomed, from being dead in sin to being made alive in Christ. God, we've declared you the good news this morning, the goodness of our God we've seen in the land of the living this morning. We honor you for presence that you've brought to us today. God, we thank you for that. And God, as we now transition into listening to your word that you've blessed Pete to bring to us today, God, would you open the eyes of our hearts? Would you tune in our ears, God? Would we not be like those that Jesus described, hearing but not understanding, seeing but not perceiving? God, make it that we are open to the kingdom of heaven this morning as we receive your word. Let it cut through the stuff that needs to be cut through. Your word sharper than any two-edged sword. God, we thank you for that. And we just honor you for your presence amongst us this morning. It has been good to be with you this morning. Continue to be with us as we sit and receive your word this morning. We thank you for that, God. Amen. Thank you, worship team. Thank you, Pete. Well, good morning. It's great to be here. We've been at a conference last week over in Wellington, and it doesn't matter whether you're in a room of a thousand or two thousand or however many's here today, but when you're in the presence of God, there's something that just ignites my heart. And um, it's so good to be back home in, in our own little fellowship here. What's that? Uh, as a, a, a wanderer, someone pray for him. <laughs> lost in the wilderness <laughs> but yeah no I really mean that um, it's so exciting to be back in our church and coming back with um, some vision about what's happening in our in our nation and in our new life movement and I'll share a little bit about that in a while but um, I just want to pray Father thank you for your word thank you that it brings life and restores our soul and Lord I just pray that uh, Lord as I speak that Father, my words wouldn't be what's heard, but your voice speaking deep to deep would touch each one of us and draw us closer to you. I ask that in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Um, My last sermon uh, a couple of weeks ago, I, I called it Pass the Salt, Please. And it was about when Jesus spoke to his followers and he said that you are the salt of the earth. He didn't say become the salt of the earth. He said, you are the salt of the earth if you're my followers. And we talked a bit about how salt, um, some of the the things that salt does in the natural can kind of, we can take analogies from like like salt is a preserver. And as, as, as Jesus followers, we're to preserve his values in our life. And salt brings flavor and savor to food. And we should be doing that in our culture as God's people. We bring flavor to it. There's lots of different opinions and things out there that are pushing in on us. But we bring flavor to it and savor. I hope you see yourself like that because Jesus said you are that. You're not becoming that. You are that. Don't leave it up to somebody else to, to be that. And sold also brings cleansing, used for wounds. And as God's people, if we're walking with Jesus, we bring a message of cleansing in a dirty world that's getting dirtier all the time. Your message that you carry and I carry, it's a message that brings cleansing to things that we hear and conversations we get in. And Jesus was also talking about salt as being like truth. And if 
God's word is the truth, then if people hear the truth spoken with the right attitudes, they'll thirst. Salt makes you thirsty. And they'll thirst for more of what you carry. But if you're too salty, you'll turn people off. So we've got to be careful that our flesh, our thoughts, our opinions aren't getting in the way of what Jesus said and how he said it. And the other thing about salt is that it had great value in its day. And God places great value on each one of us who, who follow him because we're important to him and his kingdom. Great value. And so after I spoke about that verse, the next verse, the very next verse that Jesus talks about in Matthew 5, 13, he starts to talk about that you are the light. He went on to say in verse 14 to 16 of chapter 5, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it leaves, it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And we can look around and see examples of that just in our church life and the ministries in the church. We have amazing ministries like Learn and Live Camps, bringing light into kids' lives. CAP, bringing light into people who are suffering from oppression, from being in debt. Community Kai on a Monday night here. It's bringing light into our community, doing good deeds to glorify our God. Our youth ministries, our children's ministries, our community Christmas lunch is light shining in our town, bringing glory to him, not to us. You know, at our New Life Conference last week in Wellington at night, um, as we stayed in this hotel and went out on our little balcony thing and just looked out over the harbour and what a beautiful harbour Wellington is at night time. You see all the light shining off the buildings and off the hills and it reflects on the water and you know ships coming in there in the dark during the night see those lights and there's no mistaking that they're in a city. They're in a place. You know, in the city, when I, mean, I think of it, when I go into the city, because, uh, you know, we're country people here. When we go into the city, it can be like, wow, this looks really amazing. But when you live in the city, you get used to it. But for me, it, when I'm going in there, I think of things like safety and provision, comfort, resources, shelter, community, work, and life. It's all happening where the light shines. It's the same in our church life. If the light's shining amongst us, all this activity is happening. And when I see the lights, it activates a sense of anticipation in my life and adventure when I'm going into the city. Wow, look at all the stuff going on here. We don't get this every day. And it brings hope and and a sense of excitement, and there's going to be opportunities there to do something. I don't know about you, but when you see the light on a hill, it, it does something. And Jesus was talking about this. You know, and as a church, if we live for Christ, we will glow like lights. And when we glow like lights, what we're doing is we give hope to those that are without hope, to those that are living in the darkness. Whatever that darkness is, whatever we carry, we bring light into that situation. In 1 Corinthians 4, 6, it says, Paul says, For God, who said, Let light shine out of the darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. Wow. 
You know, on the last night of conference before the last session, uh, Deb and I took my brother Dean. Some of you know my brother Dean. He's a pastor in a church in Upper Hutt. And we took him out for tea. And as we sat at this table, all of a sudden my brother Dean said, wow, who would have thought 40 years ago when we sat in a flat on the floor, well, it's over 40 years, talking about Christianity, who would have thought 40 years later we would be here at a conference, being pastors in churches and having followed Jesus all these years? Who would have thought? And we just sat there for a few minutes pondering, looking back on the, on the journey of our life. And, and it was a beautiful moment. You know, you have those moments where you just, all of a sudden it hits you. You can go on and you don't appreciate some things about where you've come from. Because back then, Dean was just a young guy. He must have been about 16. And, you know, he was wrapped up in canoeing. He, he was so good at whitewater slalom canoeing that they had him picked for the next Olympics. And so every weekend, he was away on these trips where they were going to the biggest rapids they could find around the country, and they'd be camping out, and it was a lifestyle. And he got into the lifestyle, and it was taking him astray. He wasn't a Christian, but he just was caught up in that whole lifestyle. Deb, I think, was working at that time at a, pl uh, at a community organization as a secretary. I was painting and decorating. And our life was just start, sort of beginning. We were just coming into the knowledge of Jesus. And it was out of those conversations over 40 years ago that my brother Dean, like Deb, had received Christ with her flatmates in her flat, and, and I'd received Jesus. And then my brother, through those conversations, received Jesus as well. Conversations are important. You're the light in your conversations. You know, our lives took a whole new direction, completely different to what our background told us it would look like. When you use a torch at night to light darkness it's so that you can see where you're going not so much about looking where you've come from isn't that true you know when we look back on our life all of us carry stuff from our past and praise God that he's the God that that, that forgives and he heals and he restores and he's building a new thing in us and as I look back on those years, I think over the last 40 years plus, there's been ups, there's been downs, there's been hard times, there's been good times. But it's been the light of Jesus that's kept us going. Kept us going forward and not been pulled into the past. Pulled into what our family's expectation was. Pulled into the habits of our family, the culture. It's the light of Jesus that keeps us looking forward. Yeah. It's been an exciting life. And I hopefully it is for you too, being transformed by Jesus. You know, to keep our light burning bright for the future and the present, we so need a good source of power, don't we? John eight twelve. Jesus said this, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The light of life. You know, I bought this, this torch a while ago, and it's a rechargeable torch. And it's really bright. For a little wee torch, it's really bright. It's a great, <laughs> it's a great spotlight for at night time when I go hunting. And, uh, but the thing with this is it's a rechargeable torch. So you can recharge it. It doesn't take batteries. And, you know, we need recharging to shine our light at times because this is going to go flat after 18 hours of use. And it needs to have a good source. And 
Jesus as the source of our light. He's the power of our light. We can't be light without Jesus in, in us, living and, and activating the things of his kingdom in our lives. He go flat. I don't know about you, but I've been flat a few times in my life. And when you're flat and a Christian, it's a sad place. We start to get into habits of pretense, pretending all th things are okay on the outside because we don't want others to think less of us. And they can be bad habits. And every now and again, we realize that we're in a flat place and I need to do something about it. You know, I love that our church is part of the New Life Churches of New Zealand. I love that name. In fact, when we became pastors here, we weren't part of New Life Churches. And we went out and we made sure that we became part of a big movement of churches so that there was accountability, so that we could have anointing and be blessed and be covered and be joined and connected, all those good things. But I love the New Life name because it carries a message. New life. There's so many people in our lives today that are searching and looking for new life, that want a new start. And none of you here today will have to look far to know somebody that wished that they could have a new life, a new start, could begin all over again. Well, guess what? You carry an amazing message, an amazing message. There's so many people looking for meaning and purpose in life. So many people have lost their joy. And I'm, not, I'm talking like I'm talking about people outside of God's kingdom, but I'm talking to us here too. Because every one of us is going to go through times when life hits us and circumstances crash in on our lives and, and take something away from us. And we have to know where to go to be restored, to get the light back in our lives because the flame can go out. And we've got to look after one another in this world, in this culture. You know, life has handed out some pretty big beatings to people, Christians. And I know people here that have been through some really tough beatings in their life, emotionally, mentally, in all kinds of ways. Dreams have been lost. Heartbreak has left scars. But it's still very raw. You know, all of us have gone through growing up years where we've faced different kinds of things in our life. We've faced things like rejections and loneliness and identity crisis and um, self-worth issues. Relationships broken, trust smashed, confusion about what on earth am I here for. All those kinds of things, we all pass through those, don't we? We've got to be careful we don't get caught in them and they become the the perimeter for everything that exists because now we have Jesus, we have a forward-looking light in our life that's looking forward, not looking back. We can't see the path forward without the light of God in us revealing what he's calling you into. You know, I said to someone the other day, we were talking about somebody who was struggling with their faith and, and, and he said, I don't know what the problem is with them. And I said, well, I think they have fear in their life because fear restricts us, but faith enlarges us. And we've got to remember that when we're walking in the light of Jesus, that don't let fear into your life about the future because it will rob you and restrict you of what God's got and has intended for your destiny. Yeah. You know, we don't have to look around very far, do we? But I just love the church because the church is a supernatural organization. We're a supernatural people with Jesus. We've got the Holy Spirit in us. We're no longer living on our, on our own, you know, strengths and abilities. 
there's a deeper source within us. And we've got to remember that our faith in Jesus is the firm foundation. It doesn't move. It doesn't shift like the sands of this, this world around us are shifting and trying to change the values of God and the principles of heaven over us. Jesus doesn't change. Our circumstances may shift, but Jesus won't. It's a good promise, isn't it? You know, a word that came through at conference that I want to share briefly with us was a word from a guy called um, Paul Gerling. And there were many great words, but there was a kind of a theme came through. And I was, I'm always, I'm, I'm a listener. Some people are talkers. Some people are interpreters. I'm a listener. I like listen and gather. And, and, and through the conference, I'm listening. What's going on? What's the Lord saying here? What's, what's, how does that connect? And getting the message. And the message that Paul Gerling brought was a, a message called, It's Time to Dig. It's Time to Dig. And I, I forgot to mention that you might have put it up, Hayden, that the title of my message is The Pit or Promise. The Pit or Promise. And we've got to remember that we have a choice in our life. God gave us the, you know, Choose you this day whom you will serve. And every one of us has to choose every day whom we're going to serve. Are we going to serve a pit or are we going to serve the promises of God? So it's time to dig. And at conference, you know, they talked a bit about how over the last four years, um, church, faith, life for many Christians has changed a lot. A lot of Christians have lost their momentum over this last four years, particularly. A lot of people have left churches and, and, and ended up wandering about, going nowhere, not fellowshipping, not connected. And a lot of Christians have lost their joy. The joy that they once had and walked in somehow seems to have just dissolved and disappeared. And it's been a season of drought for many Christians where Christians have just felt dry and tired and lost the anticipation of what's Jesus going to do with me tomorrow? What's, what's God bringing me into? They've lost that excitement. And that's sad because, and, and I've got to admit, I've, lost, I've been there. I've been through that. You know, and we've got to shake that off. We've got to... We've got to discover what is it that's caused that. Why am I walking in this? How have I allowed this to speak into my life? What's caused me to stop speaking God's truth and declaring his promises and believing it in faith? And it's been a tough time for many Christians. But the church, one of the exciting things from conference that we saw was that for the first time in New Zealand, we had the three major Pentecostal movements working together in unity. New Life had their conference. The Assemblies of God churches had their conference. And Equippers had a conference. Uh, Elam, sorry. Elam and Equippers. Um, yeah. And... In the midst of those conferences all happening, these three great movements in our country who are spirit-filled shared resources. They shared the speakers. So the speakers that came in and spoke to the different um, movements were bringing the same message across our nation. And that's exciting. There's a sense of newness, a sense of unity, a sense of momentum building in our nation amongst God's people. And you could feel it. You could, it started to speak into your heart that God is moving. This is a new season. We've been through a dry season, but we're coming into a new season. We're going to see amazing things happen in our country and in our churches. Um, yeah. So the church, your life, because you are the church, the Bible kind of describes as being like a well, a well of living water to those who are dry and thirsty. 
Jesus is the well that we go to to drink from. He's our light. When we drink from Jesus, we become a well for others. And some of us, our wells have run a bit dry. And it's time to dig new wells. For some of us today, that's going to speak into your heart. Because the Holy Spirit is saying this across the land to God's people. It's time to dig new wells. Wells speak of blessing. They speak of growth. They speak of refreshing and life. And, and Jesus is our well. You know, if you're not finding refreshing in your well at the moment, then maybe it's just a hole. If you're not finding the refreshing that Jesus promised us, then maybe you're trying to get something out of a hole. And a hole can be filled with things that we put in it to try and meet our needs. See, what do we rely on in life if we're honest? Is Jesus your first port of call? This is a question that we've got to search ourselves with. Is Jesus my first port of call? What do I rely on when I need something in my life? I mean, Jesus isn't going to buy me the bread from the shop. I've got to go and do that. But where do I go to when things get tough? See, we can fill our hole with things like control. I just need to control everything and I'll be safe and secure. As long as I'm in control of everything. And so we start to fill our hole with a sense of I need control over things. And so when things get tough, as long as I can make everything work so that I'm in control. It could be your talents and abilities. When you have need in your life, you just rely on your own talents and your own abilities. I can do this. Or it could be you have a sense of resourcefulness. I'm a very resourceful person. I know who to go to, where to go to, how to get this, how to get that. So I fill my hole with resourcefulness. It could be the sense of looking for man's approval in everything I do. If I fill my hole with things to do with pleasing man, then I'll be happy. If I make people happy, then I'll be happy. Because you're not really, really, you're just living in a hole. It's not a hole of blessing. Or it could be a sense of entitlement that you've filled your hole up with, that I deserve the stuff. There's all kinds of things that all of us will recognize when we allow the Holy Spirit to show us things that fill up the hole in our life. If we're not drinking from a well that's got living water in it, that's refreshing us and renewing us day by day, then we're sucking from something that's just dragging the life out of us. Quick fix stuff. Yeah, last for five minutes. But then it's gone. And we're back to where we were again. You know, have you ever heard of the phrase, it was the pits? You watched Australia pay Fiji, they were the pits. But the pits is an expression that, it's in the dictionary it says, the worst possible place, the worst possible person or the worst possible thing, an unpleasant, boring or depressing place. See, Jesus didn't give his life as a sacrifice so we would live in the pits of this life. I know when Jesus calls us to be the salt and the light of this earth, he's definitely not saying that you should ever look like the pits. I bet all of us know somebody that we said, oh, that person, oh, he was the pits. <laughs> said something, did something, oh, what? But Jesus came to bring life. And Jesus is the only one who can fill that hole in our hearts. 
And Jesus spoke to the Samaritan woman at the well, remember? As she went to collect water. And in John 4, 13, Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks the water, this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. See, our souls need Jesus' living water. We desperately need it. I love what Tanya said on worship this morning, that beautiful verse that she read out about how, you know, we, we find rest beside the still waters. He, he re- refreshes my soul. You know, in the book of Genesis in chapter 26, I'm not going to go there, but just briefly, it talks about Isaac, who was the son of Abraham. Remember, Abraham was the guy that Jesus promised that he would, his descendants would be blessed and he would be blessed. And, and, and so Isaac's the son of Abraham and God sends Isaac into a foreign land to settle. And this foreign land's full of all kinds of enemies and things, but he's called to go there and live there. And, and remember, we can kind of make an analogy out of this that we've been called to a foreign land too. We're exiles, like Isaac was an exile in a foreign land. We're exiles on this earth because our real home is in heaven. And so we're living in this, this foreign land. It's got advantages, but it's not where we're going to spend eternity. And in this account, he's in a foreign land, and there was a famine in this land. And so Isaac goes about digging wells in the land. And everywhere he went, it flourished. He became wealthy and rich because things grew. He had ended up with crops and servants. He became powerful in the land. In fact, some of the wells that he had were wells that were dug by his father, but they'd been blocked by his father's enemies. And so he got in there and he undug them, got them unblocked, and everything flourished. But as he did that, as he unblocked them, and as he established new wells, he started to make enemies because the people of the land got jealous of him. They got envious. They got afraid of the power that he was starting to accumulate. And so they would go behind him and around him and they would block up the wells again, fill those wells up with with stuff so he couldn't use them. And so he would move on and he'd dig another well. And then all his neighbors and enemies would come and they'd argue and fight over the well. It's my well. It's my well. I want the use of it. And so he would move on again. He'd give it to them. Here, have it. Take it. Peace be with you. And he'd move on again. He'd dig another well. And this went on for a long time. But everywhere he went, he prospered and he found water again and again and again. And we've got to ask ourselves, like from this, are we ready to fight for our wells? Are we ready to dig new wells? Even when the well that you had has been blocked up with stuff, with hurt and whatever it is that's filled your well and taken away the joy of your salvation and the joy of the future that you have with Christ, whatever's filled your well that stopped the refreshing joy of the Holy Spirit and the knowledge of Christ and his presence in your life, are you willing to fight to get it back? Or have you given it away? Don't give it away. Don't give up because Isaac kept doing it time after time after time and eventually he settled in a land where he had his servants dug a well and there was water and they prospered. It's time to fight for our wells. All kinds of muck has got into our lives. Oppression and addictions, disappointments, opinions of others. All kinds of issues have blocked your well and you've lost the joy 
that God wants you to walk in. Only you know what that is. But when I say that, I mean God knows already. Are you open to challenge, to the challenge of digging a new well? And digging a new well could mean just changing the way that you've always done it. Sometimes we've learned things in our past and we're stuck there. We thought, oh, well, this is, you know, we've got caught up in religion. I go to church on Sunday, that's my faith. No, that's not your faith. Your faith is your relationship with Jesus and how he speaks into your life. Church is part of that. Church is what keeps the well safe. One another, looking out for each other. You see, a good well doesn't need to be fenced because it keeps producing water. And church shouldn't be fenced. It shouldn't keep people out. It should be a place where people come because there should be so much love and hope and faith and goodness here in our community for all. And so we need to get renewed. We need a renewing of the spirit of life in us. You know, if you're looking for success in your life according to what God's standards are, success in God's eyes is obedience. It's no good carrying on saying, I, I'm, I'm trying to be obedient. I want to be obedient. No, that's not obedience. Obedience is obedience. Obedience is doing what God's calling you to do. If you're not being obedient and, and, and doing what God's called you to do, then you're being disobedient. It's, and that goes for all of us on all kinds of levels. Yeah. So you and I are eventually going to find the promise if we keep digging. Isaac did. Eventually he found the promise, the well that he could live with and live in. And it's important. It's really important. Because Isaac settled. And that well that he settled in still exists today. It's the well of Bathsheba. And it's still there today. You see, when we dig a well, we're not digging it just for, for me today. We're digging a well for our children and our children's children. And you and I have to decide the way we choose to live our life, whether my children are going to live from a pit or from a promise. What are my children and my children's children going to drink from? Are they going to drink from the pit that I have drunk from? Or are they going to drink from the promise of the well of God that brings life? And we've got a part to play in that. Because your well is a well of legacy for others. And we find our promises in the well of life. It's abundant. It overflows. It's enough for us. We've got to believe for greater seasons to come. And remember when we're digging a new well or unblocking your well, you're going to find opposition from within and from without. And you need help to fight that. You're going to find opposition that's going to try and divert you, distract you, take your promises from you, plant fear in your life about what you're going to lose, all that kind of stuff. You know, as we sat in that restaurant thinking about over 40 years ago where we were at and what we left behind, there's nothing back there that I ever want to go back to. It's all in front. And at that point when we asked Jesus, it was all in front, step by step, with the light of Jesus, just doing one step at a time, not pointing up there and saying, that's where I want to be. It's one step, one safe step at a time. That's all God asks us to do. Don't reach too far, too high. Just do what Jesus says. He'll never ask you to do more than what you can do. Yeah. 
So I just want to leave that with us today to st- try and help us, stir us up. Maybe it's a new season in your life and it's, you know, you've been living in a well that's been half filled with muck and you've only been able to get some stuff out the top. Or maybe it's been dried up. Or maybe it's time to dig a new well, a new way of doing things in your life. And I know some of you guys have really worked hard over the years at digging new wells. And it's been fantastic to see that you're drinking from new, you know, a new source. You've found new sources, new springs in your life. And we need testimonies of that. Testimonies of how people have been been changed and found new life as they've drunk from new water, fresh water. I hope that and pray that, you know, in the season to come, this stage is going to be full Sunday after Sunday of testimonies of new people coming to Christ and coming into the presence of, of Him and what He's done in their life and seeing families changed and all kinds of things broken. So I want to finish with this and let's just finish with a, a, a song this morning and maybe it's an opportunity where God is just saying, you know, surrender because that's what it's about. It's not about trying. It's not about hard work. It's about surrendering. And as we surrender, what we do is we make room and then we allow the Holy Spirit to come in and fill and renew. Can, can we get the worship team up? Um, is Clay still here? Thanks, Clay. And... Um, because God wants to fill us. He's either gone to sleep or he's, um, he's, he's, he's intrigued. <laughs> but Psalm eighteen twenty eight says, For it is you who light my lamp. The Lord my God lightens my darkness. Let's go away to remember, remembering today that you are the light of the world. You're also a well that people can come and drink from because Christ in you is your living water. We all carry something. Just as we um, finish, let's just pray and, and spend a couple of moments just waiting on the Lord. Father, we thank you that you are the light of the world. You call us to be the light of the world. You call us as your salt in this earth. And Father, you are the well that we can drink from and never be thirsty again. Lord, I thank you for each person here, each person listening, Lord, that you know them intimately. You know the past. But even greater still, you know their future. And Father, today we want to come to a place, Lord, where we can just offer up our lives as a new sacrifice and surrender all to you, God. And Lord, as we we surrender those things that your Holy Spirit brings to our, our mind and our heart, Lord, I pray for a supernatural touch on each life where you'll come in and fill that place with a new sense of your peace and your joy and your direction, your forgiveness, your healing, Lord. Whatever's needed, God, may you be the one who refreshes and not the things of this world. Oh, God, we just surrender to you right now and ask you, Holy Spirit, to illuminate whatever's blocked my will. God, as we worship you today, we bow down to you. We acknowledge you as the King of Kings, our Creator. We're your creatures and you care deeply for us. And we thank you for that. We thank you for the blood of Jesus 
that washes over us, that atones us from our sin. Lord, we thank you that you give us new life in Jesus. That, Lord, there's a whole new life beyond the cross. Father, I pray that your spirit would fill us with a new vision, new excitement, new adventure for what's coming in our families, in our homes, in our workplaces, in our careers. Lord, may your promises lift us up and carry us forward. Lord, may you fill the pits in our life that we may never go back into them. Seal them, Lord, in Jesus' name. Close them in Jesus' name. Lord, take us to a place where we're filled by your Spirit. Let's stand and finish with a song. And if you today just need somebody to pray with you, if you want to make a declaration to God at the altar and just bow before Him, you respond the way you want to respond, the way that you're called to respond. Just pretend you're in a room by yourself. There's nobody looking, nobody's watching. This is between you and God, between you and your Savior, the shepherd of your life.
Thank you, Father. Thank you, King. Man, the, the living water. A light in the darkness. God, we thank you for your word this morning. And God, I pray that you'd show us each where we need to go and change and, and do something about our, the state of our light or the state of our well. God, whether it's just connecting more with you, the power source, that source of living water, whether it's going and just getting rid of a bunch of distractions, the things that become like a basket that sits over a lamp or the, the mud that we throw into our pits. God, would you show us and give us grace and humility to go and deal with that stuff? God, you might use us to go and encourage someone else to help them see, you know, some stuff that they might need to change. You might be calling us to take this good news that we've got and go and make our feet beautiful this week. God, would you help us to take what you've given us this morning and go and live out obedience? God, that we that we might have success in your eyes, God, through obedience. Not our good thoughts or our well-reasonedness, but through obedience. That childlike faith, God. We thank you for your encouragement this morning. Yeah, God, we just bless all that you've done here this morning and we bless all that you're going to do. We thank you, God, that you come and dwell amongst us, that your kingdom is here amongst us, and that you are lighting the way forward for us. We thank you for that, King. Amen. Well, church, that brings the, the formal parts of what we're doing to an end. But church is far more than just the formal parts. Church is you guys fellowshipping together, seeking out God together, encouraging one another. If you feel like it, go and pray for someone before you leave. Go and greet someone who you haven't met before. Church is active and we're all supposed to be part of it. Cool. Have a great week, folks.